You are waiting for your garlic bread in the oven. While looking up at the stars through your kitchen window, you ask yourself, could you send garlic bread to space? And more importantly, could you still eat it if it came back? (laughs) Some mighty important questions. Usually, when it comes to garlic bread, there are only two things people care about. Do we want cheese on it? And, oh yeah, eating it. That mouth-watering, garlicky taste combined with the soft, warm bread. Okay, focus. How are we going to send the bread to space? Given that NASA's first space shuttle cost roughly $49 billion, I don't think they'll allow us to borrow a rocket ship for the day, since they may have, you know, more important things to do. I know, it's hard to believe that some people don't take garlic bread as seriously as the rest of us. Don't worry, though. All we need is a balloon. Not the kind of balloon we're used to being around at things like parties, where you're surrounded by pizza, burgers and bread buns, hot dogs and bread buns, and cake. I think bread might have too strong of a hold on me. Anyway, the kind of balloon we need is a weather balloon. A weather balloon is explicitly designed to reach high altitudes of up to 24 miles. It carries instruments beyond our atmosphere to send information on temperature, humidity, wind speed, and atmospheric pressure back to us. A French meteorologist, this guy, first started experimenting with them in 1896, and his work led to the discovery of the stratosphere. Hmm, I wonder if he'd been proud of these balloons now operating as an extraterrestrial taxi service for our garlic bread. Maybe not, but I'm sure he'd be delighted knowing that hundreds of people worldwide today release these balloons for their own experiments every 12 hours. Most standard organizations believe that space officially starts at the completely arbitrated Kármán line, over 62 miles above us. Sending the bread into orbit would require a speed of tens of thousands of miles an hour. Without our rocket ship, which conventionally travels at a speed of 17,000 miles per hour, we won't be able to get the bread that high or to travel at that speed. Okay, no, you can still keep the rocket. I'm happy with my amazing weather balloon, which, by the way, will still get us a third of the way to space, bringing us to the area known as the edge of space. Mm. Given that the atmosphere up there is so thin, about 1% of the pressure at ground level, it's really not that bad of a substitute for actual space for this test. I was never comfortable with being over 62 miles away from my dinner anyway. So, this works much better for my food abandonment issues. Ow, my ears! I can already hear you at your computer screaming, What is this guy talking about? I've seen videos of things like pizza being sent to actual space before, using a similar method. Why should we settle for the edge of space? Well, many cameras operating in those videos to document the object's journey use a fisheye lens. This lens exaggerates the Earth's curve compared to what it looks like at those heights, giving off the illusion that the camera is closer to space than it is. (laughs) Glad we settled that. Unlike if I were to ask you which is better, pizza or garlic bread. Moving swiftly along, thank you. Now that we've got our weather balloon to which we've reluctantly attached our garlic bread, the moment for takeoff has arrived. We launch the garlic bread to the sky and wipe the tears from our cheeks as we watch it disappear beyond the clouds. In comparison to a rocket, the pace of our balloon may as well be that of a tortoise, and it will travel at a speed of over 1,000 feet per minute. So, a good way to distract ourselves from the sadness of our bread's departure is by asking ourselves what the garlic bread's in store for during its journey. Well, in two hours, our weather balloon can rise above the clouds higher than the paths of jet planes, passing through the ozone layer in the stratosphere and reaching altitudes of 22 miles or higher. The balloon will endure temperatures as cold as minus 90 degrees centigrade, meaning we'd better have a microwave on hand should it make its way back to us. The balloon will expand as it ascends, from 6.5 feet up to 26 feet, because air pressure decreases as the balloon climbs higher in the atmosphere. What happens next would be a truly satisfying experience were my food not being put at risk as a result. Our weather balloon pops. And just like that, our garlic bread will begin the descent from the skies. Wind conditions dictate how far from the launch site the bread will land, but we can expect it to turn up no more than 75 miles away. As is the case for experiments with weather balloons, a parachute is attached to the cargo, 
which will help ensure the bread's safe return and a reunion with its best friend, my stomach. Some say it's a one-sided friendship. Even though it's this stomach of mine that's currently making animal noises from starvation, it's actual animals who now pose a threat as potential predators of snatching our dinner. Engineers have designed packaging for exercises like this, equipped with GPS and a servo. This packaging will close shut approximately 3,280 feet above the ground. It will protect the garlic bread from unwanted landing spots and the various jaws of the animal kingdom, dramatically increasing the likelihood of being able to eat the garlic bread if we can relocate it. In all actuality, weather balloons used for experiments like this are doing more damage to wildlife and nature than vice versa. Marine animals like turtles often mistake the remains of weather balloons in the water for jellyfish and eat them, thinking that they've just got themselves an easy meal. This is damaging for these animals, given the components of these weather balloons contain rubber and battery acid. Arguments have been put forth that weather balloon testing is ultimately another form of littering. If this video inspires you to try and send some food to space using balloons, keep this in mind. So, the hunt is now on. Not for any wild animals, but ourselves. What's that saying, though? Fail to prepare. Prepare to go without that fantastic piece of garlic bread that you've just launched into the edge of space, which you're now on your way to reclaim? Or is it just preparing to fail? It doesn't matter, as suggested by the parachute and protective packaging. We're doing neither. To ensure we could find the bread once it landed, we attach radio trackers to the balloon before launching it. These send a signal with a GPS position to the ground, which is then put on a map for us to chase, giving us a good idea of where the garlic bread will be found. Man, I love technology! And just like that, the moment has arrived! we found our garlic bread intact! And after some moments of passionate hugging and loving strokes, I'm ready to take a bite! So, was the weight worth it? How's it taste? And can you eat it? Yes, you can! But the taste? Mm, not that great, actually. And despite mentioning it earlier, I forgot to bring my microwave. The bread's been frozen from the frightening temperatures experienced on its journey. And I actually mean frozen. The bread itself has an icy middle. But before we can even discover this, we'll notice that when we go to rip a piece of the bread off, it doesn't tear as normal. Instead, it snaps off, as if we've just broken a piece off a twig. We can even hear the clicking noise. My warm, soft bread is no more. You'd be better off keeping this for dessert in the event you run out of frozen ice cream. On second thought, let's just throw it in the trash. Nonetheless, it's pretty cool that we were able to send this garlic bread to the edge of space and still end up eating it, right? Before I pass out from starvation, I'm going to the store to buy some more, which I definitely won't be sending to space. Why don't you let us know in the comments if there's any food you'd like to send to space for seasoning before eating. You're sitting at a coffee shop on Mars, keeping your head down, trying not to draw any attention to yourself. It's crowded, and many people are singing, dancing, and talking loudly about life on Mars. Your drink arrives, and you sip on it. So far, no one recognizes you. You're wearing a cloak with a large hoodie to cover your face and disguise yourself from everyone. Someone accidentally bumps into you and sees your face. The music stops, and now everyone is staring at you. You have nowhere to hide or run. You ignore the leering eyes and keep sipping on your beverage. An old bearded man sits in front of you, amazed to be in your presence. So, it's true. No one believed you'd make it, he says. You don't reply and continue with your drink. Everyone else gathers around you. Another man speaks. Well, are you not going to tell us how you escaped from the clutches of the Space Kraken? Everyone gasps in shock. No one has ever made it to tell the tale of the Kraken, except you. Your plan was to find your messenger to take you to a spaceship far away from this planet. But it's too late, now that everyone knows you're here. And the messenger fled, knowing all the attention was on you. You lay back your hoodie and explain what happened. Two days ago. You're in your full gear, ready to make the voyage into deep space. You have a solo ship that's designed to maneuver through all the obstacles in space. You prepare the rest of the gear and fuel up. Everyone is watching you, 
knowing that you might not make it back. But the Kraken has been floating in space for too long, disrupting shipping containers bringing in goods. A small ship like yours can sneak past its acute sense of smell and vision. But larger ships will get destroyed. You made it your mission to find this Kraken and study it. If you learn its ways and patterns, you can figure out how to get rid of it. Everyone says their goodbyes, and you lift off. You know that it'll be a very long way to get there. Possibly three days in the emptiness of space. You saw some quick footage of it, but no one knows exactly where it sleeps. Or if it even does sleep. You put on some tunes and set your ship for cruise control. You make some notes and set the camera to document yourself while you prepare everything you need. You also have some cameras outside recording everything that moves. Even thermal sensors to catch living creatures floating in space. After a few hours, you exit the safe quarters of Mars and enter into the hostile territory. There is no place to hide or anyone to help you. A few little ships like yours pass by now and then. They watch you going further to the Kraken. You notice many floating signs powered by machines warning you about the Kraken. The cameras start recording, and you begin your video journal, which is transmitting to your network at home. So far, nothing. It's quiet and dark. Hours pass, and you're just floating in the middle of nowhere. You almost feel like you want to turn around. But then, you pick up something in the sensors. You see a large, live object nearby. You turn off the lights and slow down your ship. You resume recording and start talking to yourself, explaining everything. The object is getting closer and closer. You move aside to avoid it and latch on to a floating rock. But you still don't see anything. Out of nowhere, you see some glowing jellyfish-like creatures flowing together in a cluster. On your thermal sensors, they appear to be large objects. But in fact, they are just little creatures. According to your studies, these creatures are some of the main foods for the Kraken. So, they're probably running away from it. After a few minutes, the creatures float away, and you launch yourself out and turn the lights back on. A few more hours pass, and you still see no Kraken. Suddenly, a whoosh shakes your ship, and you're thrown slightly off course. You notice that a large object has spiked your thermal sensors and left. You keep going and check the playback settings to see if your cameras manage to catch something. You try to look carefully, but it seems like a gust of wind blew past you. Which is weird, because there is no wind in space. You check the thermal sensors and notice that a large object shaped like the Kraken has zipped past you. It's still around, and it has probably caught your scent. Your systems got some DNA particles and are studying them. After a while, they show that the Kraken's skin can change colors according to its surrounding. Its skin is thick and made up of some cosmic fluorescent material that is new to any creature you've ever come across. The system continues studying it. After a while, the Kraken goes off your radar and disappears. You circle back, trying to find it. People back on Mars can see the data and already have information about its size and skin quality. They even see some footage you've managed to catch. As you continue driving towards it, you open your floodlights, trying to see anything. Your cameras are still rolling. Suddenly, the Kraken changes skin color and appears right in front of you. Its large tentacles flash around, whipping nearby space debris. Its large eye that's as big as a bus looks right at you. It opens its mouth, and you see layers of sharp teeth circling like a grinder. It has a large beak that can break your ship easily. It starts flashing its colors rapidly as a way to warn you. It shoots out some liquid to move in a no-gravity space environment. It's moving towards you until it launches itself. Your ship has an auto force field for protection, but it can't sustain the powerful bite of the Kraken. After only a few seconds, the shield breaks and your ship spirals down to another planet. You crash landed in a swampy land. Your ship has survived, but it can't take off. The analysis of the Kraken is ready. It shows that it doesn't need oxygen to breathe, and its DNA is evolving. Now that it got a bite of your force field, it can adapt itself to create a bio force field of a similar nature. But you crashed on a planet that is foreign to you. 
you put on your safety suit and observe the environment. The atmosphere is filled with nitrogen and sulfur. You get out and walk around. It has similar gravity to that of Earth. As you venture through the swamp, you start seeing little skin particles similar to those your ship has caught. The liquid below you is some foreign substance that seems to be deteriorating your suit, so you opt to hover. The trees are strange and seem to be living off the atmosphere, but there is no sign of life anywhere. Suddenly, you see a huge crater that leads to the center of the planet. You enter it and see some ships similar to yours. It seems that the Kraken knocked them off course, and they all crash-landed on this planet. Many of them seem to be intact, while others are completely obliterated. Your sensors pick up another reading. It senses another creature dwelling in the center. You try to get closer. You're doing your best to be as gentle as possible, but you feel the ground shaking below you. You duck down and try to avoid the rocks falling overhead. A large tentacle pops out of nowhere, and then another, and another. It swings itself out and crawls in the open. According to your system studies, this kraken is ten times larger and even looks different. It doesn't spot you, but it can sense that you're around. It starts thrashing the planet, trying to find you. It knocks your ship. You try to find a way to start it, but it's missing a piece. You find another abandoned ship and take out the part that you need and put it on your ship. Your suit has an auto-repair function that allows you to fix your ship without the tools. After a few minutes, it's ready for takeoff. You power up your ship, even though it's damaged, and lift off. You manage to sneak past the Kraken. Everyone at the coffee shop is silent. Many don't believe your stories. They had stopped receiving live transmissions before you were knocked off by the Space Kraken. Out of nowhere, an alarm rings and warns that the Kraken has arrived! Everyone rushes off in a panic! You hear a voice in your head. It's a bunch of gibberish, but you start getting visions of the Kraken talking to you! It knows you're here, and it's coming for you! You're sitting in a car in a space shopping mall parking lot. You've just bought a gift for your sister's birthday and should have time to get it to the celebration. Today, there are a lot of people in the mall, so it's difficult to leave the parking lot. Finally, you're approaching the gate. You press the button next to the steering wheel and activate the gravity cushion. It allows the car to hover above the ground at several inches. The car wheels are sliding inside the body, and a huge turbine is coming out of the trunk. The front glass becomes a touch panel with many buttons and screens. The gate opens, the turbine releases a flame, and your car flies out of the parking lot, right into outer space. Thousands of flying cars are rushing past you on an invisible space highway. You're moving away from the mall, which looks like a huge space station surrounded by holograms of advertising brands. Before Earth, you need to get to Mars. There, you want to repair the car's engine. The navigator plans a route to the red planet and you go on your way. You're far from Earth's orbit, so you can get to Mars in several hours. You activate the autopilot and decide to take a little nap. It's 2048. The world's population has exceeded 20 billion people. There's too little space on Earth. Humanity is not ready to colonize other planets yet, so scientists and engineers from all countries start building huge space stations. This unloads the planet by more than 50%. The stations look like huge rings. They imitate the Earth's atmosphere, have artificial gravity and vegetation. People move to stations, but often return to Earth. Rockets fly between the planet and orbit. But such transport is expensive and inconvenient. Automakers make efforts at creating super-reactive flying cars. Some years later, people slowly colonize the Moon and Mars. Now, getting to the red planet is as easy as getting to the neighboring city. Cars fly along certain routes that are similar to airways for planes. Engineers create special digital highways that can only be seen through the windshield. Of course, you can fly through space as you like in any direction, but if you fly to a mall or the moon, you have to stick to the established digital route. You wake up and approach Mars. People almost don't live here because of the unfavorable atmosphere and difficult weather conditions. But Mars has the biggest service center for cars and the coolest amusement theme park in the solar system. To get there, 
people have to stand in a space traffic jam for hours. The dashboard shows you have some problems with the turbine. You put on a spacesuit, take a laser screwdriver, and get out of the car. You're in zero gravity, flying up to the turbine and fixing the problem with the screwdriver. There are thousands of cars around you. People are yawning inside, listening to music, and watching movies. You get into the vehicle and slowly move on. The engine or turbine often fails in the middle of a space highway. When this happens, your car activates its emergency mode. The dashboard automatically sends a signal to the nearest repair team. You're just floating in space and waiting until the mechanics arrive. They tow the car to the nearest auto service. You have enough oxygen inside for a couple of days. And if you run out of it, you can ask for help on the internet. Good people flying by will stop and share their oxygen supplies with you. Finally, you get to the car service station. Mechanics install a new super jet engine for your car and repair the turbine. There's not much time left, and you promised your sister you wouldn't be late. You get into the car and leave the Martian orbit at full speed. The new engine runs silently and doesn't shake the car. You increase the speed and fly along an almost empty digital highway. On your way, you meet a lot of small satellites showing holographic ads. Fortunately, you have an ad blocker. You turn it on, and the space banners become invisible through your windshield. Finally, you see a small blue dot. This is Earth. At this moment, you remember that you need to feed your dog. You leave the route and fly to the moon. There you have a small cottage with a house, which you bought for a small price last year. People can't change the atmosphere of entire planets yet, but you can install a small dome and fill it with oxygen. Inside your dome, you've built a house, a swimming pool, and even a small vegetable garden. In the past, people went to the countryside to take a break from the city bustle. Now, everyone just buys houses on the moon. You fly through the dome, land on the white surface, and put food into a dog bowl. They're renovating your apartment on the space ring, so you live on the moon with your dog for a while. You can see other cars flying up into the neighboring domes. Some vehicles are elite supercars with a large gravity cushion and ultra-reactive engines. They can fly 10 times faster than the speed of sound and have artificial intelligence that can talk to the driver. There are also old, rusty space cars. Sometimes people attach a jet engine to an ordinary car and cover the body with a mix of copper, iron, and silver to travel over long distances in a cold vacuum. You can also see a lot of taxis in outer space. Sometimes, getting to the moon is cheaper than getting to the other end of some city on Earth. The reason is traffic jams on the Earth's roads. Also, there are a lot of flying buses in space. Every day, several flights depart on the Earth to Moon to Mars route. People are constantly building something on Mars. The huge car service and the amusement park are done. Now they're creating a scientific center there to study interstellar jumps. Of course, engineers need building materials for such construction projects. Several times a week, long trains fly from Earth to Mars along a separate space route. Initially, trains carried people, but they became unprofitable. It's much cheaper and faster to get to Mars by your own car or bus. Finally, you're leaving the moon and approaching the Earth. The dashboard signals you're out of fuel, so you decide to stop at a gas station. These stations are everywhere. They're fully automated, controlled by artificial intelligence. You're flying up to one of them. The fuel pump is automatically connected to your gas tank. The super reactive engine consumes improved rocket fuel instead of gas. You transfer money to the station through the touch panel and fly away. Hundreds of digital space highways lead to Earth, and every road is filled with cars. Traffic jams again. There are security checkpoints in the upper layers of the atmosphere. Customs services check documents and car trunks. While standing in traffic, you're watching garbage trucks. A lot of space debris is floating around. Slow-flying trucks controlled by artificial intelligence collect garbage in huge containers. Then, they fly away from Earth's orbit and unhook the containers. These garbage cans have little turbines that let containers fly far beyond our solar system. Then. They heat up and burn all the garbage from the inside. Finally, you pass all the checkpoints and fly into the middle layers of the atmosphere. 
Our planet looks like a huge cyberpunk world, but only lighter and more beautiful. Huge cars disperse the clouds to improve visibility. Firefighter flying ships are coming to one of the stations where a fire started. You encounter hundreds of gas stations, air hotels, cinemas, and shopping malls in the sky before you reach the ground. You're approaching a parking building. This is an 80-story skyscraper filled with cars. People leave their vehicles and use elevators to go down. Fortunately, there's a place near your sister's house where you can park your car. You land, put your hand on the passenger seat to take the gift, and, oh no, it looks like you left it on the moon. Behold the distant future. Yep, humans have successfully colonized Mars and the moon. Problems with overpopulation and hunger on Earth are solved. But soon, a new threat looms over our planet. Uh, excuse me, planets. And the moon. Anyway, scientists have figured out that in 150 years, the sun will explode and destroy our entire solar system. Bummer. There's enough time to build a fleet of huge spaceships and evacuate everyone. But it's not enough time to come up with some sort of sci-fi space jump. It's been a long time since people found a new, potentially livable planet, and the nearest one's a several million years ride away. There's no other choice. Humankind is evacuated into gargantuan spaceships, and the infinitely long voyage begins. A few decades pass. We leave the solar system and watch our sun explode. A huge flash and that's it. There's no more light. Just small, faraway stars and the infinite black depths of space. All ships are on a synced autopilot that won't go off course no matter what. Even if everyone on board were to disappear, the ship would still arrive at its destination. So, the upside, humans will survive for millions more years. The downside? Because of all of that time spent on space transports, we'll look different, totally different. Ships arriving to the new planet will be populated with shapeless, pulsating biomasses sitting inside metal exoskeletons. Here's how it happens. Bones in space get weaker, so do muscles. There's no gravity, so your body's not under any sort of pressure to keep it running properly. Astronauts on the International Space Station do a lot of exercise to stop their muscles from withering away. Ah, back to the story. There are gyms and special machines that recreate gravity on every space transport. But to save energy, they're only plugged in in a couple of hours per day. Unfortunately, no matter how hard people exercise, in space it just won't be enough. After the first hundred years, human bones have become so brittle that anything remotely physical can lead to injury. After another hundred years, people lose the ability to stand up on their two legs. But it's not only because of weak bones. After all those years in zero gravity, the human body's already changed a lot. A big problem is that people lose their sense of balance. If you try to stand up, you'll just fall. The ship's captains dismantled the gravity machines. They weren't working anyways. And all the sports equipment on board got taken apart ages ago and used as spare parts for the ships. The lack of gravity didn't just make people weaker. It also made them taller. The spine needs gravity to keep it stable. And now all those backbone discs have stretched themselves out. Humans are starting to look like blow-up toys. Everyone's given mechanical arms and legs. You just strap them on and get to work. Servicing the engine, cleaning out the bedrooms, throwing trash out into space, lifting anything. Not happening without those mechanical arms and legs. Time passes and people become more helpless. Luckily, the mechanical bodysuits keep getting better and better. Since the sun collapsed in on itself, human eyes have been having a hard time. Inside the ships, the sun is replaced by special artificial light that also gives off vitamin D. Since there's way less light overall, people's pupils become wider. Then, after a few more centuries, their vision really starts going downhill. But this problem is solved by technology. Artificial lenses magnify light and keep humans from going completely blind. The ships get disinfected every single day. That stops bacteria and microbes from multiplying. But it also means that the human immune system doesn't have to fight off any diseases. 
Pretty soon, humans can't defend themselves against anything. Even a mild cold could be seriously harmful. It's fine for now. There are no germs or anything on board. But what's going to happen later on down the road? On the ship, millions of plants grow in special greenhouses with water and ultraviolet light. The plants produce oxygen and spread it through the entire ship. Of course, it's not enough oxygen to satisfy millions, but it helps people remember the planet they left behind. After centuries of living on spaceships, humans have adapted to the new conditions and almost stopped breathing. Lungs have disappeared almost completely, and humans are starting to develop other ways of getting oxygen – from water, from liquid oxygen tanks. We're becoming a totally new species. But it's not all bad. Genetic engineering is developing every year. Full-fledged life support suits are created. They help with movement, strength, speed, vision, hearing, even speech. People's voices get so weak they can only speak in whispers. Luckily, the suits have built-in microphones and speakers. There's no food anymore, just specially created liquids. After all that time in space, the human stomach can't digest anything anyway. Fancy a handful of peanuts or a small cracker? Forget it! In the beginning, the special space food had loads of flavor. But over time, people sort of forgot what things were supposed to taste like. Eventually, they stopped adding in flavorings, and because of this new tasteless food, tongue receptors stopped working. Soon, people lost all sense of taste. For some people, this life seems unbearable, but they have a choice. They can just slide on into a cryogenic capsule for millions of years. Then it's just a matter of a quick defrost when the ships finally arrive. But it's seriously risky to be frozen for such a long time. There's no guarantee that the ships won't crash into a huge meteorite, or worse. People start to take a different approach. They upload their consciousness to a central computer. It's safer and requires much less power. And when you wake up, you can just download your mind into a new, modified human suit. Some people decide to stay awake and live a, quote, normal life. Thousands of years pass, then millions. Humans look really different now. All their limbs are now artificial, and the exoskeletons they wear are controlled by mind power. With each passing millennium, arms, neck, legs, and spines, they become smaller and smaller. Brittle bones soon dissolve into nothingness. Eyes, nose, and mouths disappear. The brain isn't protected by a skull anymore. It's just surrounded by soft skin. Only consciousness remains. Nowadays, a human is a powerful high-tech robot ruled over by a small, pulsating bag filled with a brain. It's been a few million years since humans left Earth. All the ship's inhabitants have already forgotten that their species was born on a planet with gravity. The history of life on Earth has become a myth, an ancient legend. Most people believe that these ships are their true homes, always have been. That's why, when humans finally reach their destination, no one's that eager to get off and have a walk around. Life on a new, unknown planet seems like a huge pain in the spacesuit. Gravity, air, bacteria, germs… It takes several thousand years of evolution for humanity to get used to these new conditions. Luckily, humans have a secret weapon – technology. At this point, all humans are downloaded from the central computer into new robot suits. People face a choice – get off the ship and make this planet their new home, or stay and live on the ships. Those that stay on the ships set off into the expanses of space to explore the galaxy and discover new worlds. Those who decide to stay on the new planet have to adapt to the new conditions. It's pretty different from Earth. There's a different air density, different weather patterns, and strange new chemical elements. It will take another million years before these robo-brain sacs take on a new shape. One day, these distant human descendants will want to research their origins. They'll invent a ship that can jump through space and time. The research will lead them to the distant past, to the small planet Earth, to now. This might sound crazy, but just imagine that tomorrow someone lands in your backyard and they're your descendants from the future. Those passengers who stayed on the ships will probably find new planets and maybe decide to stay on some of them. 
Their bodies will change and adapt too. So, in billions of years, the universe will be inhabited by different amazing creatures that all have something in common. They were all humans once.